probably took lessons from my dad, legitimate lessons for maybe two years at the age of nine and ten. I learned from the Buddy Rich book. And I don't think I made it all the way through that book, and, and I lost interest in drums. I lost interest in, do, you know, I thought uh, practicing and all that was taking up too much of my time. And I couldn't get my psyche into like, okay, I want to be a drummer and all that. Because I really, I think because my father was a drummer, there were so many musicians around the house that it wasn't anything exciting to me, if you know what I mean, because it was commonplace. And it wasn't until I was in high school, all I do, did is listen to records. I don't read real well. Um, I just wanted to play, and we had, in high school, we had Hendrix power trios back then, three-piece bands. And all I would do is imitate watch guys, listen to guys. I would sit at home five hours a day after school, put on headphones, and just play to the radio. Before I even had a stereo, all there was was the radio, and I would hit the radio until I heard something I liked and play to that. And I used to love mimicking styles of different drummers and whatnot. And one thing led on to another. It was like playing with guys, which is the best thing. There's always, I don't care what caliber players they are, just to play, because you need all the experience playing you can get. And what happened was when I was a senior in high school, there was auditions for um, Sonny and Cher. Now, at that time, I was playing with a group of people that, you know, we were into Hendrix and whatnot. So wearing a tuxedo and something like that was not a good, a cool thing in the eyes of my peers or my uh, partners. But I took the job anyways because I wanted to go to art school and it cost a lot of money to go to art school. And I was going to say, okay, I'm going to make $400 a week and I'll tour with Sonny and Cher and do Vegas and all that. And like I said, my reading chops weren't really good. And Sonny and Cher music was real simple and I would look at their charts and during rehearsals I'd scuffle. But the next time I heard the tune, I'd remember the figure and it'd keep it in my head. So they said, oh, this guy can read. Well, I really couldn't. It was just good memory and stuff. And what happened was, is as playing with Sonny and Cher, I met more musicians, and uh, one thing leads to another. It's being in the right place at the right time. I think it was after a Sonny and Cher tour, I was playing at this place, Dante's, this club on Lancashire, just with a friend. A friend called me up, and it was like a, a fusion-type band. And the guys in Steely Dan, Fagan and Becker, happened to, for whatever reasons, happened to stop off at that club that night. And so they heard me play. They didn't intend to hear me play, and they asked me to go on the road with them. I went on the road with them, and they liked what I did on the road. And so they said, well, would you like to, we'd like to give you a chance to play a couple songs on an album. And they gave me a, you know, thank God for them. And instead of using, at the time, they were using Jim Gordon and some other guys, they gave me a chance to uh, play a couple songs on an album. And then they, I got to do another album with them. And people hear what you do on that album, people would hear the Katie Light album and say, ah, who's this guy playing? I'd like to hire him. And they'd hire me, and it just keep, kept snowballing like that. And it started off with luck of being at the right place at the right time, I would say, you know. Uh, plus, you, having, granted, you have to have some musical background or some knowledge of social music. It's funny, a lot of people, I, I meet a lot of guys and they study and their chops are unbelievable. They can read anything you put in front of them. But there's some anti-social thing about their playing, meaning um, maybe it's too stiff or it's too much. It's not good street music or they're not aware of just playing with your everyday Joe, which is what it's all about. Because half the stuff I try to learn how to play or figures or... I'm just a timekeeper. I basically always thought drums are to keep time. It's, it's fun and for groove. I've never done a solo in my life. I don't think I, I, I never tried. I, I have this mental block about playing four bar drum solo because it, it doesn't sound right to me for a drummer to do solos and stuff. I just like playing time. So that's my life story. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? You don't solo even with Toto? I'll never have in my life. <laughs> uh-uh. No, I think it. I think the drum solo in a God of the Vita kind of messed me up for my life. <laughs> it did, because I remember I was in high school doing a gig, and some big biker guy came up to me and wanted the band to play in a God of the Vita, and we said, "Are you serious? That's not hip." Well, his boot in my face made us understand that it was, it was a really great song. <laughs> what was it like to work with Randy Newman? Oh, this. That's the best stuff. Newman, it's. Here's another thing, you, you prepare yourself for sessions and whatnot, but a guy like Randy Newman, 
he leaves everything wide open for you. And basically some of the best sessions are where people, all you see is bar numbers. I've never seen, I've never gone to a session, man, I can't remember in the last 10 years where I've ever gone to a session and somebody writes out a drum part. Never in my life, or, or a fill. The only time you'll see a figure, if it's an ensemble thing, or if they want you kicking a figure. In today's contemporary pop music, there's not a lot of ensemble type figures, or what you would say your big band type chop things. But Newman is completely loose. Whatever you come up with and, and, your, and your imagination. And that's, a lot of people love guys that use their imagination. I, I like people, I'll tell you, the basic thing, if you're doing a session for the first time, you're walking in, people don't want to know if you, if you, some guys will say, oh, here's my first chance. And they start playing and they try to play all their hip chops and all their hip fills. And it turns off some people sometimes because basically all they want to hear is time. And if you get through the first day, where you've laid down good time for them, then you'll get called back because you're not um, inhibiting anybody. You're not freaking anybody out. You know what I'm saying? Basically, that's what people look for in a drummer. Then, after they get comfortable with you, then you can start whipping out your, your tasty stuff and your, your licks and whatnot. Yeah? Yes? How do you prepare for a session? I don't. Um, I'm always nervous before everything I do. And I get there about an hour early in case there is anything for me to read so I can go in the back room and woodshed. Um, but basically I show up early, uh, the only, uh, usually I like showing up about an hour early just to get sounds with an engineer. And by the time I'm sitting there hitting toms for people or snare drum 20 times and all this, I'm warmed up a little bit and I, and I feel comfortable with whoever walks in the room. But I, I don't do anything really to prepare for a session. I should maybe do a little bit more, but I don't. It's, yeah, there's nothing to prepare for really unless it's something where this, I know the music's gonna be. Like a few times Zappa has called me to do sessions and I've turned him down and he think, and thinks maybe I'm busy or something, but I'm just scared to death because I know, <laughs> no, I know guys like Vinny and Bozio and whatnot, and I've known them for years, and I've seen what they have to sight read. And the Zappa would tear me apart. He'd, you know, get PO'd for me wasting his time if I uh, did one of his sessions. I think, basically. You, you told about you were nervous, right? Uh, have you a solution again? That I mean, some uh, concern about that when you're nervous about uh, before a session or before going on stage. You know. You know to be relaxed to relax my nervousness yeah there's nothing people like no seriously like um it's so funny the 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 beat the beat of rosanna and there's all these little little things in between well that started off years ago i don't know who it was i was playing for and my i was so nervous that my left hand was just was just bouncing and i took that as it I just let my, and I said, yeah, well, I'll channel my nervous stuff to a beat or something like that. But no, the only thing that ever conquered, I, I, I swear to God, like last night, I can't tell you how many times I played at the baked potato, and I'm supposed to be a well-known drummer who should have his shit, to, I mean, his stuff together. But I'm at the baked potato, and there's a couple drummers in the audience and stuff, and I'm, I'm always nervous. And it'll take about two songs before my arms get loosened up, and that I don't care that they're there, you know, I just play. But I think being nervous is a good thing. You know, channeling that energy right. Adrenaline, it's, yeah, adrenaline. It's a good thing. So stay nervous, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On the Michael McDonald sign, keep forgetting. How did you keep that right hand going without locking up? That was take two. We ran it down once, and when, I don't like playing 16ths with two hands sometimes, unless it's, so fast that you can't do anything else because it don't feel right to me. I've always, I used to watch, um, what's his name, man? Uh, James Gatson. James Gatson used to do all the Motown stuff and then Ed Green and all these guys were famous for their right hand doing 16ths. So when we started the tune running it down, I'm going, yeah, okay, and I'm playing 16ths and halfway through the first rundown, I'm going, oh man, what have I gotten myself into? It's like, I got to use two hands. We did the second take and the take that's on the record, I think it's the, after the second chorus, you can hear, you hear me do an accent in the hi-hat. What happened was my stick broke, 
on that take. And my stick, I, I threw my stick this way, and I'm just playing with my left hand and my left foot, and I was grabbing for a stick, and you can hear the accent of the stick. And when I grabbed it, I swung around like that, and you, and you can hear that. And that was just from my arms were about to fall off. <laughs> but that's just, you know, sixteenths. Just the more you do it, I guess, the easier. But I'm telling you, it was. You don't want that to be the first tune when you're doing an hour set. Oh, there's a new Toto album coming out in about three, four weeks that I think is really cool. I mean, it's a pretty good album this time. It's a real rhythmical album. Some good things. And I've just been doing some sessions. I, I stopped doing sessions for a while because I, I started a family, so I have a four-week-old boy and a two-year-old. And that's been taking a lot of time. Yeah, they're happening. <laughs> Definitely happening. Both of them are drummers, you know. Um, <laughs> no, that's so that took up a lot of time, you know, starting a family and stuff like that. But I'm starting to do work again, and I've been doing some stuff with uh, Boss Gags is doing a new album. That's been great. A, a couple things, you know, just records, good fun. Or drum machine live? Now we're hitting my favorite subject. Yeah, uh, yeah. You're, I think everybody's going to have, will eventually fa face the fact that you have to play with a click. It's so funny. I, like I said, I haven't been doing sessions for about two years. The last three months, I've been starting to do a lot of sessions, and here's what's been happening. I, I walked in to do a session, and I met this guitar player, Dan Huff, who I've heard about. It, I've heard about him. I've heard his name. He's like one of the new hot kids in town on guitar, doing lots of sessions. And Robbie Buchanan, great keyboard player, and it was Nathan East on bass. And Nathan and I are looking at each other, and these guys are flipping out because they've never played with a live rhythm section in the studio, and we didn't use click. And they were amazed that we got a great track without a click, and that nobody was doing overdubs. And I'm looking over at the engineer like, man, what, am I 50 years old or something? Like, what has happened in the last two years with music? And what's been going down is, obviously, you must all be aware of all the drum machine stuff, and lots of big albums. I mean, uh, there's been a, a lot of work that is taken up by Fairlights and Claviers. And that's been going down for a few years now. But what's happening all of a sudden, believe it or not, is people want to go back to using real drummers. And, and the reason being is they thought all this Sinclavier stuff, all this drum machine thing, was going to be cost efficient. That was the number one reason. It wasn't because, oh, do we have to take a bunch of takes with a rhythm section until we get the magic one? Because what makes people have great reg records is captivating the magic that goes down on the record. And you're only going to get that with live players. You're not going to get that from a silly drum machine. And everybody's records sound the same. I mean, everybody stole a sample from this record or that record. So you hear five major artists, and they all have the same snare drum sound. And there's no dynamics and nothing feels real good unless it's just a dance record that goes straight ahead. And what's been happening is a lot of people, I've been working, a lot of people have been calling me up to work wanting a real drummer because, number one, it's more cost efficient. Because I sit there and watch a guy try to program one drum part into a synclavier. It takes him two days. I mean, for a good part. And I could have had my friends over and done the whole album in three hours for the guy. <laughs> and so I think they're start. I, it's... It's I mean, thank God, drum, the rhythm sections in general are coming back. People just want it because it feels great. And I always, what always cracked me up is guys, well, listen to these great synclavier sounds and the gated echo and the reverse this and all that crap. I'm going, well, man, why don't you just sit, put that stuff on a drummer? You, it's all outboard equipment. Why, if, why don't you, when you're mic in my snare drum, add some gated AMS to the snare drum, add gate the room that I'm in, you know, get into some stuff. And people are doing that. So I think... There's going to be more, it's coming back to the rhythm section thing. It definitely is. I wouldn't say that unless I saw it happening before my eyes. But yeah, you have to play to a click, and a click is hard, and it's a good thing to practice to, is playing to a click. And here's the thing. When you leave here, if you ever, any of you get a chance to do, somebody wants you to do a demo, or you get your chance to go in the studio for the first time, they'll probably end up making you use a click. Probably. Now, when I say make and use a click, they're either going to have a Lin machine and they're going to program some simple beat and you're going to be hearing this Lin machine in your phones. You have to play that or they're going to use regular digital metronome, which is just quarter note clicks or eighth note clicks. If you can, I would, I would request, 
Instead of a Lin machine, I would request for a cl uh, digital click. Reason being, with a click, you can play behind the beat if you want, you can play on top of the beat if you want, but you can judge. You gotta dig, with music, most music, unless it's jive, disco, dance stuff, a verse will feel one way, the chorus should lift up maybe and feel another way, the bridge or the solo section should feel something else, and you should, it should be, stuff should be emotional. Now you can't be emotional when you're hearing a Lin machine in your phones and it's going <laughs> You can't be emotional, because while you're trying to groove, you have this stiff thing in your phones and it's not fun to play with something stiff. With a click, you can say, oh, I'm in the verses, and you can sit there and say, and judge where you want to lay the beat to that quarter note you're hearing in your head. And when it gets to the chorus, you can play on top, and it won't freak you out, because in your mind you go, okay, I'm going to play on top of the beat. And you try to play consistently on top of that click, and that works out best. At least for me it does, you know. And, you, and it's good for you to help. If you're, if you're the drummer on a session, and whether it's a producer or an artist, and he says, okay, I want you to cut this with a click, and we did this drum machine program, through your own experimentation, whether it's you playing with a drum machine or with a click, if you feel better playing with a click, then recommend, say, hey, is it possible to do this with a click instead of the drum machine? You know, speak up for what you know you're going to perform better with. Because they don't care, usually. If, if they're not keeping any drum machine program, then they don't mind. You ever use one live? No. No way. Uh-uh. Toto, the only thing we ever done have done live is my brother Steve on an emulator would have background vocals on maybe two or three songs on the emulator. That means he has to key, key off, and you hear the vocals. Well, what I would do, there was the song Hold the Line, and the song Africa was sequenced, because there was all this percussion stuff and all this marimba things going on. What would happen is I had, um, my drum guy behind me had a little RX-11, a Yamaha, and it had, all I had was quarter note cowbell programmed in it. He would put up the tempo, he would punch up the tempo of, say, hold the line. I would hear one bar in my monitor and he'd shut it off and I'd start the song. And when the first chorus came up, Steve would hit the hold the line and all of a sudden I'd hear that louder than hell in the monitor and I could tell if I was ahead of the beat or behind. And I could tell by the first couple of eighth notes and it was really not, you, we were never that off or anything. Because playing with clicks and trying to hear clicks in the monitors or machines and everybody else playing in a live situation, it can be really hard. And it, can, it could sound kind of funny. It can get a mishmash on stage. So we try to stay away from clicks on stage or in a live situation. Acoustic drum versus electric drum. <laughs> I, I, that's a personal. I mean, do you think it's coming back to acoustics now? Kind of... Yeah. I. It... I, can't, I personally can't stand electric drums, and every manufacturer knows I don't like them. And I think, I think electronic drums are ripping people off. They're, they're too expensive. See, I have friends. I mean, over the years, you get to meet people, and you know what's inside. You know how much it costs, the FOB, the manufacturing cost to make these things. And when you see what's inside, it's garbage. Sound-wise, I mean, I have, I've had Simmons 5s, and I've had to pay 500 bucks for a guy to make them sound decent. And I bought everything, Cooper t uh, chest, uh, oh, I've got tons of electronic drum stuff, and I gave it all to my father. <laughs> no, because it's, it's uh, to me, it's a, it, I, I can't use the words to describe how I feel about it. <laughs> Number one, there's no, I mean, they, they say, oh yeah, we have touch sensitive pads here, we got dynamics on drums. BS, that's not no dynamics. What, five dynamics, and you're saying you got dynamics, you know, uh, Five increments of, no, it's, and they sound funny to me. I see how much people invest in their electronic drum rigs. Now, what they invest in electronic drum rig, if you spend, uh, how much is those Rev 7s, a couple grand or something like that? You know, the Yamaha Echo with all the presets. Well, if you just get one of those and just have acoustic drums, I could make my snare drum or my toms with one rack effect sound way better than a Simmons or try to make, I mean, you know, if you like that kind of sound, get your acoustic drum sound just as well, good. But all the triggers, all these guys have made me triggers to try on my acoustic drums. And I tell people, hey, if I can't go and you hear every little thing I just did dynamically and every other way, then it's a waste, unless I'm just playing one beat back beats and playing uh, disc dance music, and they sound horrible, man. It sounds like a TV commercial. <laughs> boom, boom.
But that's, that's I have a, it's my own personal thing about electronic drums. But they are cool. Uh, people, there are people who use them great. So you used, like to use a lot of dynamics in your sound, a lot of ghost notes and stuff. Did, do engineers not be able to gate you as much as they want for ice? Ah, good point. Well, you got to dig. A lot of engineers use gates. You know what gates are? There's, I guess, maybe you guys may be more familiar with drummer gates, but there's several companies that make gates. So the gates are going to cut off. If I hit my tom and it's ringing a little bit, the gate's going to cut it off and close down the signal. And they can adjust how, how quick they want that to close down, how much information they want it open. Now, what happens is I like my drums live. I don't put anything on my drums. Except my snare drum, I have a couple little pieces of gaffer's tape, but all my drums are wide. And when I hit my bass drum, all the toms are ringing like crazy. I hit my snare drum, there's all these sympathetic vibrations and overtones, and usually engineers freak out. Man, I'm hearing this unbelievable overtone because everything's close mic'd and whatnot. And so they'll gate your drums so that you don't hear those overtones. The only time you hear that drum is when you hit it, it opens the gate and then it closes again. So it does, you don't hear any of the snare rattle leaking through. You don't hear any cymbal ring. What happens when they, when they go ahead and just do that right on the spot is they're missing because they have you hit your snare drum. And they set their gate. Well, if I hit my snare drum like this, after they set the gate, that beat's not coming through. That's not going to make it through this microphone. Now, it may make it through my overhead or my hi-hats, but it's not going to be right. And all of a sudden, the groove isn't right. And that's a big point. Here's another point I got to make. It has to do with the stuff you play, dynamics in your playing, and the tuning of your, your tubs. Here's the thing. Um, has any, have you guys been able to play with a Lin machine or any drum machine? Has everybody at least seen one or messed with one? OK, here's the thing with those. If you've experimented with one, let's say that we tune the bass drum. You're just programming bass drum, snare drum, and hi-hat. And say I'm programming something that's just like this. Now what happens is a lot of guys will want to get a fat snare drum sound. And they get a nice tubby. And you hear the bass drum, and the bass drum's big and fat. So all of a sudden, you got two fat things going. Okay, and that's in real time, right? You're listening to it back, two bar thing, back. Now, if you take the snare drum and you tune it up real high, and it may sound ridiculous to you, but if you just do this and sit back and you haven't changed the tempo, listen to what happens to the groove. All of a sudden, the groove is going to bounce. Nothing's changed. It's still in real time. You've tuned. All you've done is tune the snare drum way up high. The reason that is is with the snare drum, the pitch up high, way away from the bass drum, when you hear uh, uh, the bass drum's on one and three, snare on two and four, all of a sudden, there's this happening. <clears throat> And all of a sudden, there's a little bit of a lope. You're going, wow, the, snare, the drum machine's grooving. You got to check that stuff out, because it really makes a difference in tuning. The other thing is, is the in-between stuff. The stuff that most of the time you don't hear, but if that should be, it's the undercurrent little grooves, like the little tiny things, Rosanna, or the, it's the little grace notes and the little subtleties that happen between the drums. You got to hear those, because those do magic to a groove, too. The more, and sometimes there's, what do you call it, Sublim, subliminal? There, you don't know what's happening, but you know, guys like Purdy sometimes keep you know, the, the real tight. Uh, those little tiny things in between, if you don't hear those, the groove would be. Tiny, this it's that nervous thing that, <laughs> that uh, really makes a big difference in groups. So when people are programming drum machines, even it's nice to if you can add if you think like a dr try to think like a drummer because that will do magic to the groove if you're stuck with the machine. Can you give us some tips on um, on developing on developing feel? Like feel like my feels lacking a little bit or something that. Um, some tips on developing that? Um, 
You know, you just asked one question I don't think anybody can do for anybody, and that's feel. You can't. There's no tricks that you can use. There's no tricks. The only, the only trick I, I, there's no tricks in getting a feel. A, I know from my experience, I remember when I first started trying to play the records, I could tell when I wasn't grooving. You know, you listen to a record and you say, man, that's a groove, that's a feel. Now, if I'm playing along and listening, and even if I'm not playing with anybody, I was able to tell over the years when all of a sudden I felt comfortable playing a shuffle. And it was just, I kept playing it and playing it. And I, this is hard to describe. I, some of you may have feel this, and I still, I wish I had time to sit down and practice again to woodshed other ideas I have. Has anybody felt the magic when you're first starting to play and you're just doing your snap-ups and you're practicing your rudiments and a few months go by and all of a sudden you're, you're digging what's happening with your muscles and your motor reflexes and your brain. For some reason they start coming together a little easier and they're, you're not, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Well, that's just from playing and playing and playing and playing and playing and playing and playing and, playing. and not by yourself either, playing with other guys so you can hear how you're feeling with other people uh, but that's the best thing I could say about this the only tips as far as copying a feel because like I said I know guys man who have chops up the butt but they feel horrible you know a feeling is just a it's a feel thing it's kind of a feeling <laughs> but basically the more you play I think the more it's gonna feel better or the more you're in tune with because really, sometimes I can, I'll can play with guys and we'll get in a hip, everybody will get in a hypnotic trance. Just because the things are grooving so great and everything sounds good and it just grooves. And that's just from every, the, all the elements being right. Anything else? Yeah. What do you think about the situation in studio when the engineer asks you to use less dynamics? When the engineer asks you to use less dynamics? Yes. And, if, and that doesn't suit you very well. You want to use the dynamics which you're using, but you... Yeah. It's, what's touchy about that yeah. is if... Yeah, it's touchy. <laughs> I know. No, because I'll walk in to this day, and you, get, you find engineers who are set in the way they mic, the mics they use, how they mic the drum, the room, and, I, and now... Maybe because I don't care if they don't dig me anymore, if they tell me to get lost, I tell them to get lost. Because the whole thing is, they're supposed to mic, they're supposed to capture your playing. Now, if you're not the right guy for the session, and I don't know too many engineers who are the producers, or if, they're the, if, it was, if it's the engineer that calls you. Usually no engineer calls me to play. An artist calls me to play or a producer calls me to play, and there's a reason they called me. And when I walk in, I cannot stand sitting there and I'm hitting a tom for half an hour. And the guy's telling me, well, can we put a little bit here, and can you tune this down here? And, and I look at these guys go, man, don't waste my time. Because I only play one way. I mean, I basically, you know, yeah, if, if an arranger or the artist comes up to me and says, ah, can you just play this? Then I'll say yes. You, but not, I'm not going to have an engineer tell me because he's going to get better sounds. Because that's not the name of the game. It's his job to capture what I'm doing. He should know whether my snare drum's dead or live, how to make it sound good. I mean, how to capture what I'm playing. And, and all the best engineers I know, don't trust a guy who you never see walk out of that control room and never comes into the room to listen to you. Why, I can't believe guys do that. I like an engineer who, while you're setting up and, and playing, and even when the band's playing, he's in the room walking around, and he's listening. Because that's what it's all about. They're supposed to, an engineer is supposed to capture the magic. And he's not supposed to make you sound, you know, uh, direct your drum sound and your playing to suit his needs so he has an easier job. Or so he says, so he says, yeah, this is the way I, this is the best sound, this is the way I get it. Because that's BS. That's bullshit, yeah. It is. But my thing is, you cannot, I'm sorry, but I don't mean for, to tell people, God, you get a chance to do your first session, you walk in and the engineer says something, you go, oh, you know, no, don't, don't do that. <laughs> Don't, really, I mean, because they get pissed off. Now, when you say he tells you not to play with dynamics, maybe it's because of he's using gates or something and some of the stuff isn't coming through. Then you have to have a, a chat with him and say, well, this is the groove. Open your gates up, if that helps. Does Any, uh, the setup change? Like the gate? 
always changes. I always carry a bunch of different size toms, slew of different snare drums, different cymbals. Yeah, cause, just because I like, if it's, if it's a particular kind of tune, I like certain instruments, certain elements of sound and whatnot to be involved with. And so I'll whip out, you know, like little bell cymbals for reggae thing, you know, the, the standard stuff. But I don't like to have extra stuff around me that I'm not going to use. So I'll just have everything in a case, and if somebody wants something, I'll put up an extra cymbal or a different tom or something. But it's good to have. I remember when I first started, before electronic drums, when I first started doing sessions, I remember everybody used to tell me, okay, make sure you have an extra set of toms. Because back then, guys used to love toms without bottom heads, which used to drive me nuts, because they're just dead. <laughs> But back then, you know, you had to do it. But I always brought different snare drums, you know, thin metal snare drum, tune them way, way to hell up for real cracky stuff, and a wood drum, you know, having the, your tools, extra tools. Have you ever played double pedal? No, I, I've never played double pedal. I, my independence is horrible. I'm just learning how to keep time with my left foot. No, seriously, like, I know I, every, you know, just, Keeping quarter notes going while I'm playing. I, I, I could play for you right now five minutes and I could not keep quarter notes on my hi-hat going. I could if I wasn't thinking about it. <laughs> but no, I'm not too, what do you call it? I'm not too, my independence is, is not the best. I, 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 I didn't go through my Jim Chapin book. <laughs> yeah? So you have a new album out, so will you have any new videos? Like on MTV? I don't know. I don't know about videos. If we do, it'll be a live video. It won't be a, if we do, it'll be a live performance. That's, I think that's the only thing worthwhile is doing a, having a, a video done of a live performance. Uh, not a mime performance, a live performance. Because uh, videos are too costly. The videos cost more, one video for one song costs more than the, the album budget. You know, which is ridiculous. It's stupid. And we're not really, sh Videos, uh, some videos are good for entertain, performer type entertainers that, you know, are fun and stuff, but for us, we look like jerks when we do videos. <laughs> <laughs> when you were first starting your uh, studio sessions, or even your live playing, how did you go about negotiating pay with people? Like, they ask you to play and they don't mention anything about money. Ses doing sessions? Yeah. You have to belong to the union to do a session in this town, and there's a union scale for three hours' work. Um, what is it, 100 and 164, 164, 170, around there for every three hours? Do you have to belong to the union? In general, yeah. But, you know, yeah, you're supposed to belong to the union, and most, most sessions are union dates. There's contracts, and there's a leader, and you fill them out and stuff. Because you can get in trouble if you don't, but I, you know, sometimes certain people once in a while go around the union and do scab sessions, you know. <laughs> a pay scale, though, anything outside the union, if somebody's doing a demo, uh, you just talk to other friends, you know, of your caliber and the kind of caliber of the act you're playing with and find out. Because I know guys who are incredible players and they blew it by opening their big mouth and asking for too much money. And if they hadn't, and took the gig, other people would have heard them, and it would have been do, doing the gig for six months at a lower pay scale, but it would have been much more profitable for them at the end, because they would have met some incredible players, and they were so good that other people would have picked them up, and then they could claim the right. See, some guys are great players, and they just come to town, and then they ask, they see, well, so-and-so's getting this amount of bread for this. I'm basically talking about touring gigs, live gigs. And they stick their foot in the mouth, you know, because sometimes that turns people off, because money is money. You know, I mean, even our group, we take three extra people out and it costs us an arm and a leg to take we, a percussionist and two, uh, a sax player and a background singer. It costs lots of money. And so I try to, if, so, if somebody asks me to do a gig, I try to be considerate towards what their situation is. You know, like I'll do, I'll do sessions for people for free if I know it's, if, if it's not, they don't have a record deal and they're trying to get a record deal. You know, it all depends on what the situation is. And that pays off in the end. Um, back in 76, I, start, I had just gone the double scale. You know, where you, you, you're making, that's good, double scale is good money. It's twice 160, you know, for three hours work. 
And Boss Gags, this is the Silk Degrees album. This is a 1976 Boss Gags. Columbia was only going to let them do one more album, and then they were going to kick them off the record label. And that album was Silk Degrees, and David Page, David Hungate, and myself spent three months with Boz. We did that album, and we did it at scale, and we didn't charge. You know, some guys, after midnight, you're into golden time or premium. You know, people charge people for the weekends, double time, and all that crap. But we didn't do any of that, and six months later, he had a multi-platinum album, and he gave each of us $30,000 cash. And I bought my house that I'm living in now with that. And all that said to me was that because I was cool, the karma came back. And usually you'll find, especially in the musical community, where people are struggling and trying to get record deals, and everybody's struggling to get something happening, that if you stay sensitive to people's situations, no matter who you are or what you've become or any of that crap, if you stay sensitive, because music is not supposed to be like other jive businesses. It's supposed to be music, you know. And if you stay sensitive to it, it'll come back to you tenfold. I think. I, just, uh, I was going to have a real hard time getting the shuffles to swing. I, I don't Man, I could dig this. My, I hate shuffles. <laughs> and I've walked, uh, when we did on the Katie Light album, the tune Black Friday, I played it twice and I threw my sticks down and I was 19 years old. I was like flipped out. I threw my sticks down. I walked out of the studio and I walked around the block twice. And I was mad because I couldn't play. I didn't feel, I, I know what a shuffle's supposed to feel like because I love hearing guys who play shuffles good. And I'm here listening to myself play and I just couldn't stand hearing myself because I, I knew it wasn't swinging. So I went up to Fagan and I said, look, get some other drummer to play this song, man. Get somebody who really knows a shuffle. And they got pissed at me and they said, no, you play it. And I came back in mad and I did that track. And after I did that track, people started expecting me to play shuffles. And shuffles are hard, man. I can't stand shuffles. I like hearing there's a lot of guys in Chicago, a lot of old cats, Chicago shuffle guys. And um, who else? Purdy plays a mean shuffle. And Jim Gordon. You, did you guys know Jim Gordon, who he is? How many people here know the name Jim Gordon? Okay, the rest of you are missing out on something heavy. This guy, he's in prison right now. He killed his mother. <laughs> no, it's not funny. Wait a minute. Five seconds. It's, I'm, I'm being very serious right now. Jim Gordon was my idol. He, he and Jim Keltner were my idols. Ever since I was 13, man, I, I used to follow this guy around. He was a, he, he's a big guy, and he's, the, to me, the best drummer in the world. The best. And he was the number one studio drummer in this town for years. The number one guy did, you know, oh God, man, I can't even begin to name all the people he did. You know, he did the Steely Dan Pretzelogic album, Carly Simon, You're So Vain, on and on and on. Low, uh, Low Spark and High Heel Boys, Traffic, Clapton, Delaney and Bonnie. Uh, and he and Keltner were, did the Mad Dogs and Englishmen tour together. Well, he left this town, got screwed up on drugs and stuff in Europe and came back kind of screwed up but he was the best drummer in the world the best his drums nobody's drums sounded better nobody grooved better than this guy you've got to go out and get albums that he's playing on and you'll have the biggest biggest schooling you ever had in your life listening to this guy his time was the best ask any I mean everybody used to talk about this guy his time is incredible his feel was incredible is inc I hope it still is and he flipped out. He flipped out and killed his mother because he was hearing her voices in his head for years. And he had to end the voices. So he went and ended the voices. So he's in uh, prison, I guess for the rest of his life. And he was the best drummer, or is, t t he and Keltner were incredible, incredible. So you gotta go out, I would go and get the, if you, nobody has the Pretzel Logic album, you'll hear every kind of groove you ever want to hear on that album that he's playing. And it's, he's a great guy to study. A great guy to sit there and play to and study. You guys know what Direct to Disc album is? Yeah. It's, now they're going to start doing it Direct to Two Track, but it was always Direct to the Labes. The records are being cut while you play behind the engineer. And there has to be several engineers. And uh, you have to do one side at a time, non-stop. So you, you start side one, and you keep playing until you're done with all the songs of side one. And then you start and do side two. If you make a mistake, the last fifth song of side one, you got to start from the top again and do it. And the drag about doing those is that sometimes if each tune is a different groove, now you know what it's like where you're, it's one thing to be in a club and you finish doing an up-tempo shuffle 
and applause, 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 and everybody's having a drink, and you're wiping your face off, and you got a minute to psych, psych yourself into the next group, which may be a nice slow thing. Direct the disc, you only have this, the amount of time that's in between a space on a record to, to either get your music up or get your psyche into the next groove. So they're kind of, they're rough. But that's what that album was like. See, and but now what they finally realized is these directed this when they cut the lathe is uh, you know an acetate. They're cutting the record. Well, those parts are only good for X amount of records, and these are those audiophile type records. Well, what they finally realized, what they did is they would start making cassettes or CDs of these directed disc records. And they take the, make the cassettes and CDs off the two track, because they're always running a two track, digital or analog, behind the lathes just in case. But what they decided now is they might as well just do these records direct to two track, meaning that way you can do, you just do it the same way, you do the whole side, but say the second day on side one, there was the cut three was just magic, where you can cut it out and put it in that and you still got pretty much a consistent performance, but you have some of the magic takes. They don't get lost. And you're able to uh, add them to the album. But they are, it's a high pressure situation, direct to disc. Very, I did one years ago and it was, it was a country artist and he was doing a pop record. And each side had six songs. And the side two, the last song was this banjo player who started off the song. Well, he screwed up every time. When it got to the sixth tune, man, the guy would start playing and screw up and he, until he started psyching himself out to he was getting nervous. So I'd be sitting there on the fourth song going, okay, two more tunes. You'd look over at the guy and it's all he had to play was the intro of the sixth tune and he'd be looking at the music shaking, man. And we haven't even gotten to the fifth tune yet. And I would go, oh man, watch what happens. Sure enough, he finally psyched himself so much we couldn't, he couldn't do it. He could not do it. Because tapes never lie and that's the fear because you hear a lot of records and you know, a lot of the guys sound great on record, yep. but they have a chance to sound great. And in a directed disc, you've got to do it then and there. Even the greatest players may not have that performance vibe at that particular moment, so you just do your best. Do you know Billy Myers? By name, I do. Keyboard player, yeah. Bill Myers? I don't know what label it's going to be on, but I just heard a directed disc that Vinnie Caliuto did, man, that is so incredible, it will blow everybody's mind. I mean, I haven't heard Vinnie play this good, ever. And it's what's more, doubly amazing is that it's a directed this. I just remember this name Myers, Bill Myers, because it's, it's going to be under his name as a keyboard player, but it's a big, it's a big band, and it's out there stuff, and Vinny sounds unbelievable. And it's a good idea, the directed this type thing. Really good idea. Any grooves you want to heard? Any things? Speak up. Reggae. Reggae? Reggae. <laughs> Anything uh, else you guys want to hear? Uh, <laughs> what kind of reggae now? There's several kinds. You know, like, there's this shit.
Yeah, my favorite groove is just 16, you know, just this shit. Yeah. forever with that stuff. I mean, that's my favorite stuff. Then there's the uh... 